your Bibles when, and let's go back to St. John chapter 10. And let's look at verse 10. And we know this scripture pretty well. The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that you might have life and that you may have it more abundantly. Now notice, what was the reason that Jesus said he came? That you might have life. That is the life that God prescribed or declared concerning you before the foundations of the world. There is a life that we're supposed to be living as, as, as members of the family of God. And in that life, there is no bondage at all. Now, I was thinking about this scripture this morning and the Lord said, read it this way. Because when we're, when we're talking about Jesus, who are we talking about? the word. He's the word. All right. So when I, you know, the Lord dropped that thought on me and I began to kind of just let that play over in my mind. This is what he began to show me. And it, it, it helps you to understand this scripture a little bit more. So it says the thief, well, we know who the thief is. It's the devil. But look at it this way. The words of the devil come to steal kill and destroy. Satan's words come to steal, kill and destroy. Now I like, I mean, I thank God for saying it to me that way, because what we do is we get centered up on the devil and, and we don't think about how the devil operates. He operates through words. So his words come into an individual's life to steal from them to kill something or to destroy something. But Jesus' word, his words come, why? To produce life. That you may have that life and have it more abundantly. So either you're going to have Satan's, what Satan's producing through his words more abundantly, or you're going to have what Jesus is producing more abundantly. Now that puts a brand new light on this particular scripture. Whose words are you listening to? Because that's what's going to be key to the life that you're living. And if you're constantly listening to the lies of the enemy, then you're being stolen from. Things are being destroyed in your life or things are being killed. But if I'm constantly and if you're constantly listening to the voice and the word of God, then that's what's being produced in life. The word of God is producing life in you, the Zoe life force of God, the life that God prescribed for you, the life that God says belongs to you. So we're, we're living between words. So we're going to look at this this morning. How words, the importance of words and what role they play when it comes to you living an overcome, overcoming victorious life. All right. So. Everybody got that. All right. Let's go to Psalms chapter 39. We're supposed to be free, folks. And it's frustrating. To constantly look at people who Jesus died for suffered for, gave his life up for, to be free, and, and, and they're still living in, in degrees of bondages. And, and I'm going to tell you something else. It doesn't matter what the bondage is. Bondage is bondage. Because a lot of times what we'll do is, well, I'm not as bad as them, so I'm not doing that bad. I'm okay. No, 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 no. If you're in any kind of bondage, then you are in bondage. Jesus didn't die for the, just for the drug addict to be free. Jesus didn't die just for an alcoholic to be free. Jesus died for you to be 100% free from everything. There was no bondage at all in the Garden of Eden. None. No sickness, no disease, no substance abuse, no anything. There was nothing in the Garden of Eden but life. That's what Jesus came to restore. 
and he restores it through words, his word. And you receive it and believe in that word restores it unto you. Now, look at this verse of scriptures here. Verse one. I said, I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. So notice, first of all, I will take heed to my ways. How do you take heed to your ways? Because what we would think the scripture is saying, watch what you're doing. Well, he tells you in the very next statement that I sin not with my tongue. Your behavior is a direct re, uh, in re, is in direct relationship to what comes out of your mouth. See, if I'm going to take heed to my ways, I need to start first of all. Let me pay attention to what I'm saying, because you will gravitate to what you call, and what you call will gravitate to you. So he says, I'm going to take heed to my ways that I will not sin with my tongue. I'm going to keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. Now, when the Lord said, add this word in there with wicked. When the pressure comes before me. See, the wicked comes to apply pressure. You know, we get the word wicked from uh, the, the word wicker from wicked. They, they come, that's the same root word, rather, is what I'm trying to say. And when you begin to braid things together, you know, there's a pressure there. So it says when the pressure comes before you is when you better start taking heed to what you're getting ready to say. Because the reason the pressure is showing up in the first place is to get your mouth to change what it's been saying. And that, that way you understand now, Pressure is always going to be before you. There is something always pressuring you to react. And if you're not in the habit of watching, he says, I keep my mouth with a bridle. If you're not in the habit of watching your mouth, controlling your words, when pressure comes up on you, you'll start saying something different than what you've been saying. And Satan knows this. This is why he intensifies that pressure over and over and over in your life. Now, let me read a statement the Lord gave me. And, I, and this is so true. He said, people fight. People fight. I'm talking about the fight of faith. People fight based on how they perceive the fight is going. The Lord told me, this. he said, people fight based on how they perceive the fight is going. If they see that the, if they see themselves winning, they'll fight on. But if they see themselves losing, they give up and quit. You fight the good fight of faith based on how you perceive this fight is going. And it's true. I looked at my own life. And if we perceive we're winning, we'll keep digging, we'll keep pressing, we'll keep going. But it's when the pressure of life gets on an individual to the degree that they don't see themselves moving or see themselves winning, the fight of faith gets thrown to the side and they go back to doing what they used to do. But what you don't get is the pressure came to change your perception about what you were doing in the first place. See, here's the problem. God's people don't realize the fight is not whether or not you're fighting. See, it's not a fight to win. You've already won. See, Jesus won. The moment you got in him, you got the victory. What you're doing now is you're fighting to maintain your position of faith in the fight. See, you're fighting to say, hey, pressure, you're not going to beat me. I'm going to uh, uh, beat you. That's what you're fighting for. I'm not fighting the devil. 
And as long as you perceive that you're losing and keep waving the white flag, you stay in defeat or you stay underneath that bondage. And so it makes perfectly good sense to me when the Lord said that. I said, you're absolutely right, because I looked at, looked at my own life in the past. And we all either are at this point or have been there. If you don't see yourself winning, if you don't see it working, basically, if you don't, it didn't work. Why? Because you base it on what you saw. It's not working. And so people come into the church and they're in, having problems and you're talking to them about their problem <clears throat> or the things that have them bound and you're talking to them about them and you're giving them the word on it. And they think because they, they made a couple of confessions for a few weeks that everything, well, it ain't working, Pastor. No, it's working. But see, you're perceiving things from the outside instead of basing it on the word. Either God's word is right or it's wrong. Now, which one are you going to believe? If you keep believing the report that it's not working, eventually you'll stop fighting and you'll just lay down and succumb to whatever's trying to hold you back. And you'll go back out and continue to live or do what you were doing before you came to God in the first place. And before you know it, you've given up. You've surrendered the fight. And a lot of times an individual ends up in a worse condition than they were before they even started fighting. Because now hopelessness has a way of trying to set in. So, so we got to learn how to take heed to our ways by watching our mouths. And when the pressure comes up on you, right away, that's the time to really get very, very, very uh, intensely tuned in to what's getting ready to come out your mouth. When you're underneath pressure like that, whether it's anger or it's pain or whatever it is, that's the time to get very, very quiet and very, very slow about speaking. But as human beings, we have the tendency to just let our mouths fly off the, off the, off the chain. When we should be uh, reining that thing in because you know, hey, now I got to pay close attention now to what I'm getting ready to start saying especially when you're underneath intense pressure. When the pain is on you so bad, you, if you're not careful and if you're not directly intent on saying a certain thing, which is the word of God, your mouth will fall off and say something at that moment and just intensify the pain that you're under. You're angry with somebody, somebody done did something wrong to you. The human nature just wants to let your tongue, just give them a piece of it, um, um, and, and you just let it rip. And said a whole bunch of stuff that may destroy a relationship forever. When you need to get very, very quiet, very, very, like the Bible says, quick to hear, slow to speak. Quick to hear what? What the Spirit of God is getting ready to say to you. Now, I've experienced this. You know, the Holy Spirit will show up and he'll talk to you in those moments. But if you're not quick to listen and slow to speak, you don't hear what he's telling you. It's not that he didn't tell you, you didn't hear it. Because you didn't take heed to your ways. And you end up sinning with your mouth because that pressure, the wicked comes and starts applying his pressure to you. And, 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 to, and, and, and what does the word wicked, wicker mean? To twist. And now I want to twist your words. By his stripes, I'm healed and I'm made whole goes from I'm healed to I don't, I'm sick. Lord, how long is this going to take? See, that's agreeing with the, with the pain. Okay. Now, look at Job chapter 15. Now, let me read verse 12 and verse 13 from the Amplified Bible. It says, why does your heart carry you away? Now, heart here is basically referring to that soulish man. Why are you, let, why are you letting your mind carry you away? 
Why allow yourself to be controlled by your feelings? That's how you get carried away. When you start letting your feelings control you. And why do your eyes flash in anger and contempt? Now, I want you to see this here. Let's look at it real. Let's, let's read it one more time. I need for you to get this. Why do you allow your heart to carry you away? Why allow yourself to be controlled by your feelings? And then why does your eyes flash with anger and contempt? Verse 13, that you turn your spirit against God and let such words as you have spoken go out of your mouth. Notice, why does the pressure come? To get you to change how you perceive the battle or the fight is going. And when you allow your feelings about it to change, then notice it says why and then allow such words to come out your mouth against God. And we all know that everybody's done it until you learn how not to do it. See, the whole thing about, now I know we're saying, well, Pastor, I thought you were talking about bondage and being an overcomer. I still am. I haven't gotten away from that yet because the whole thing is controlled by what you say. God is not the one that's, that, that put the bondage there. Satan is not the one that put the bondage there. He presented it, you took it. In the realm of the spirit, you have on one hand the kingdom of darkness, whose God is Satan, whose words are lined up with curse, and who have demons and devils, fallen angels, that are assigned to you to keep you underneath that curse. On the other hand, you have the kingdom of God. Who, who, who Jesus is Lord and he has words and his words are designed, his words are designed to bring the blessing. They're both here. Both of them are here. Now, you license one of these groups to work. Neither one of them just have a right to do anything on their own. That's why God didn't just bust up into your life and save you. You had to open up and give him permission. So now on both hands here, you have both groups, both kingdoms waiting to, to respond in your life. But everybody's waiting. Demons and devils are waiting. Angels are waiting to see whose words you're going to receive and speak. And if you will receive Satan's words and speak them, then his troops, demons and devils can go to build it in your life. But if you'll speak Jesus's words, then the angels can go to building the blessing in your life. But notice, nobody does nothing until you, you say something. This is why the scripture here says, that, and I like it, you know, why are you being controlled by your feelings to the point that you turn against God and begin to let such words come out of your mouth? We got to know better. And we do know better. We do know better. Quantrell made a statement we were driving yesterday, and it's true. She, and she says, you know, while we're sitting here in the church underneath the anointing of God, underneath the word of God, we have every intention on doing what we hear. Because there's no resistance in here right now. The pressure's gone. 
But when you get up and you go outside of here and life begins to hit you and the pressure begins to come, then why is it coming? To get you off of what you said you were going to do when you were sitting here. But see, you got to see that as a trick and a tactic of Satan and you have to counteract that. Which means you got to go into the press and say, I'm not going to fall back. I'm going to keep pressing and pressing and pressing towards the mark because there's a prize out there and I fully plan on, on receiving it. Instead of letting the pressure run you back into your hole. So words, what's coming out of your mouth? What are you speaking? Now, Job chapter 40, and could somebody in here, while I read this from the King James and the, and the Amplified, could someone get me Job chapter 40 in the Common English Bible? Now, let me get there in my, my Bible here. Job chapter 40. Now, I want you to see this. The King James says, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay my hand up on my mouth. Now, I want to read that from that common English Bible. Does somebody find it? Verse 4. Let, let me see it here so I can read it out. Verse 4. All right. It says, look, I am of little worth. What can I answer you? I'll put my hand over my mouth. Now, why did I read that? Perception. What did he say? I'm of little worth. When you're in the faith fight and you don't see yourself as the overcomer and you don't see yourself as the one with victory and you don't see yourself as the one winning, then you feel that you are of little worth or of, of no value, or you feel uh, insignificant. And when you start feeling that way, now, now, now notice, he says that this is how he felt. When you're in this predicament and this type of pressure is on you and you don't see yourself winning anymore and you don't see yourself overcoming and you feel like you're losing that's not the time to let your mouth just run free and say dumb words like we read back in the other chapter of Job. He said, do what? Put your hand over your mouth. In other words, shut up. That's the time to shut up and get your Bible out and go back and read what God said about you again. You can't let your insignificant, pitiful, poor, pitiful me, um, broke, busted, disgusted, don't feel good and sick, control your mouth. If that is what you know is getting ready to come out and you can feel yourself losing a grip and you don't feel yourself as strong as you need to be, check your mouth, cover it up. If you gotta, if you gotta duct tape your mouth, it'd be better to duct tape it so you can't say nothing than to just let your mouth fly off the chain and say all kind of crazy things against God. We have to learn how to do this because this is the number one reason why so many people in the house of God stay hooked into bondage their whole entire human existence because they do not know how to use their mouth to overcome. You never found anywhere in the, in the gospels where Jesus worked physically to overcome anything. His greatest challenge, the greatest pressure he ever experienced was in the Garden of Gethsemane when he knew where he was, his next step was taking him. 
And the Bible says the man began to sweat and begin the pressure began to come up on him until his sweat turned to blood. And in this moment, he didn't go into any physical fight or any, he, he cautiously, now you can hear his words. You can hear his flesh talking. If there be any other way to do this, can we do it that way? But he refused to let his flesh or his mind win. Nevertheless, be it, let it be according to your word, whatever your words say. I'll do whatever you say, Lord. I'm going to go with your word. I'm going to continue to speak your word. Even though this great pressure is up on me, the way out of here is through your word. That's what he was showing us here. He, he, didn't, he didn't try to fight the Roman soldiers. He told Peter, put your sword back in your pocket. They don't need to fight these guys here. There's another way to win this battle. And we're going to win it through our words. And Jesus won it through his words. Hanging on the cross, quoting the word. See, the, the scriptures give you bits and pieces of what he was saying. But if you run the reference on what he was saying, it takes you back over into Psalms and Isaiah and you begin to hear what he's doing. He's sitting there quoting the word. And in particular to the verse of scripture where if you keep reading now, I didn't see you anywhere on the cross where we heard Jesus say this, but we knew where he was quoting from. And if you keep reading on down where he was, what we did here, and you keep reading, it finally came on down to that place where it says you won't leave my soul in hell, nor will you suffer your holy one to see corruption. It was the word of God that brought him out of hell. Then the same thing will be this. It will be the same word that will bring you out of your hell. If it brought him out of his, it'll bring you out of yours. Don't you think that that was called bondage where he where Jesus ended up? And guess what? That bondage in the pit of hell wasn't wasn't strong enough to hold Jesus once the word of God went in there. All you need to learn how to do is get God's word in your mouth and quit letting your feelings and how you think and how you perceive control how you live. You need the word of God. And you need it more than just Sunday. If all you get it get is off all your word you're getting is Sunday morning word, then that's why your life is still locked up. Because you don't have enough. You don't have enough force up against your bondage to push it out of the way yet. Because a lot of Christians still live in that fantasy world. I got saved. Everything's going to be all right. No, it's not. I'm just going to be honest with you. The potential for everything to be all right is present, but everything won't be all right unless you get in there and apply yourself to the word. It's going to be the same thing. Your words will change it. If your words, once again, the words of both kingdoms, Satan's words come to do what? Steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus' word comes to do what? Produce life. All right? Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's look at this. No, you ought to tell yourself, I'm supposed to be free. You ought to tell yourself that. I'm supposed to be free. And then you take a step further and start saying, you know, don't, you know what, don't gun it. Uh, I, I am free. I'm not just supposed to be free. I am free. I am free. Now, when you first start saying things like this, your mind is going to be like, that's a lie. The devil going to be sitting there. His words, you ain't free. Look, look at this. Look at that. See, what is he trying to do? See, now notice what the devil does. He comes and he tells you, he gives you his words and then points to something. Look at that. Yeah. Yeah. All the time. Look at that. Yeah. But what did the word say? Yeah. We don't walk 
by what we see. We move by faith. The devil says, you're not free. Look at that. You know what you tell him? I don't care what that says. I'm free because it is written I'm free. It ain't got nothing to do with what I see. See, we keep falling for the same trick over and over and over and over again. And then we look at what the devil's showing us. And we're like, well, I guess I'm not free. Well, I guess you're not. If you're going to keep on looking at it that way. Why don't you tell the devil when he says, look at that. See, you ain't free. Look at that. Why don't you do this? Get your Bible out. Well, look at this. It says I am. Amen. And this right here is what put you, is going to put you in the lake of fire. So I think I'll go ahead and believe this. This right here is what delivered Jesus out of your hands, so I think I'll believe this. This right here is what got me saved in the first place, so I think I'll believe this. Start looking at the word. This is why the Bible told you, look unto Jesus, not at the picture the devil keeps pointing out to you. Look to Jesus. You know, I heard Kenneth preaching one time. And he said he had hit his toe on the, the chair or something, and he broke his toe. And he said immediately he wanted to scream out all them dumb words, but he know better. So faith, because that's what's in him, that's what came out. You know, and he says, glory to God, by his stripes I'm healed, and I may hold, told you healed, and you're whole now. He said he went on a bit. Woke up the next morning. He says, as soon as his eyes popped open like a spring, as soon as his eyes opened up, the devil sitting right there on this show, just look at that toe, look at that toe, look at that toe. You know it's broke. Look at it. Look at it. It's swollen. It's black and it's blue. Look at that toe. It's black. Look at it. He said he closed his eyes and got out of the bed. He refused to look. He said, devil just kept on pressing. Look at that toe. Look at that toe. It's black. It's black. He said, finally, see, see, if you'll go with God, God will hook you up. He said, finally, God gave him something to say. He says, well, what difference does it make if my toe and foot is black? I know a whole bunch of, got a whole bunch of friends whose foot is black. <laughs> and put his sock on and went on. And by this few other things that he said, got him and glory touched degree by the end of the day. He said his foot was just fine, healed, just a heel, walking around like nothing happened. Just fine. We can do the same thing. I've done it. I've done it. I refuse to let the devil tell me what I can and cannot do. I don't care to that point in my life. You're not going to make me sick and then think I'm going to sit down. That's no. First of all, you can't make me sick. Second of all, if you do bring your sins up in here, I'm still not going to sit down. You're not my God. Either God healed me or he didn't. Now, which one is it going to be? So now, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, let me read this to you from the Amplified Bible. <clears throat> he says, however, brethren, I could not talk to you as spiritual men. Or in other words, I can't talk to you as mature Christians. You know, if I honestly said to some of you guys, on a mature level, like, and really took the word of God and said to you guys on a mature level what I sometimes I want to say, y'all be mad at me, probably wouldn't come back. Because it'd be kind of hard. It'd be kind of hard. It wouldn't be, it, I, it's not being facetious, it's just, it's the truth. And most people, you can't just hit with a truth. You got to kind of work it around on them because if you just smack them with a the truth, then, then, you know, they, you, yes, and you just mean. No, I ain't mean. It's the truth. See, what we're used to as people, we're used to being stroked. <coughs> we're not used to the truth. We're used to being stroked. So I have to ask the Holy Spirit, give me a way to say this to where I won't hurt their feelings. This is what Paul's saying. I, I can't talk to you right now as mature men, but I got to speak to you as non-spiritual or immature men. Here's how he defined that. Men of the flesh in whom the carnal nature still predominates. When he's talking about the carnal nature, there just means 
people that you still see things based on, you still judge it based on how you feel, hear, see, taste, and th- your senses. You still base everything on, on what it looked like, how you feel. And we've already read the scripture that already said, why do you let your feelings cause you to become angry that you turn from God and start saying a bunch of dumb stuff? Can't do that. You got to learn how to control your mouth. But then he goes on, he says here, as mere infants. So he's calling the immature person an infant in Christ. Notice this, uh, uh, in whom, let me read that one more, one more time. It says, uh, but as to non-spiritual men of the flesh in whom the carnal nature predominates as to mere infants in this new life. So there's a new life, but the problem is, is God's people don't sit down long enough to learn the words of the kingdom of God. See, Satan taught you his words. See, everybody in the world is operating on Satan's words. We all did. But when you get born again and you come out of the kingdom of darkness, over into the kingdom of his dear son, then there's a whole new vocabulary that we have to learn. The problem is the only way you going to get it is with that book that's sitting in your lap. But if you spend no time with that book in your lap, that's, then, then there's no way for you to retrain yourself how to talk. So people continue to talk against the new life that Jesus is trying to bring. Notice by words, is I have come. The word has come that you may have what? This new life. But if you won't adhere to the words, if you won't take the words, apply the words, say the words, meditate the words, then the life that that word will produce is never seen in you. We keep seeing that old stuff. You're like, God, oh, man, they've been saved for 20 years. It look like nothing changed their life. Listen to them. Listen to them. I've been preaching this over here at this church for, for, for about 15 years and can sit in my office and you not know I'm in there and listen to some of the conversations y'all here in the hallway have and I'd be like, oh my God, how did that come out their mouth? Do they even hear what they saying? Now you've been sitting here for 15 years. So that goes to show you right there that just hearing me tell you what, the, what, what you need to do ain't enough. You're going to have to practice this stuff. Most of God's people don't even hear what they're saying because you got to ask the Holy Spirit, hey, plug me in. What the heck did I just say? And see, when you get in that kind of partnership with them, he'll, t- he'll say, hey, did you just the tap, tap, tap? Did you just hear that? Did you just hear that? We were driving down the street one time. Me and Quantrell were talking about this car Quantrell was believing God for. And uh, we were talking about it. We was like, well, yeah, you know, we can uh, use, use Marlins, uh, you know, what, what, we was talking about something. It's like, yeah, well, we were talking about how much it was going to cost, whatever, whatever. We were talking about, then we started thinking about Marlins A plan and the forward deal and all that and, and stuff like that. And we were just talking, but the Holy Spirit arrested me right in the middle of my speech and said, Err! and I got quiet. He said, what's coming out your mouth? And he replayed for what, I just been, what we had just been saying. He replayed it. We talking dead. And don't even see, it's just so common to us. We're talking on a debt barring uh, mentality. And God is not saying any, hadn't said anything to us about barring nothing. We're, we're believing debt free. But until you begin to train yourself to change how you talk, change how you perceive, you won't do it. And so the Holy Spirit caught me right in the middle of my sentence and replayed and said, everything that you just said up until this moment hasn't been anything of faith. It's all been how you're going to finagle, borrow, and to get. Well, wait just one second. We ain't borrowing nothing. But I didn't hear it at first. The Holy Spirit had to let me hear it. So how long are you going to stay a baby? Notice that then it goes on and says mere infants not able to talk yet in the Amplified Bible. So don't tell me what I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm an elder in the church. That don't mean nothing to me anymore. And I ain't trying to be disrespectful. 
But just telling me that you're an elder in the church don't carry much weight with me anymore. I don't mean much to me anymore. Because you can be an elder in the church. Well, I'll put it this way. You just elderly in the church. Because when I read over the Bible, it talks about an elder. The Bible says an elder is one who's seasoned in the word. See, you tell me I'm an elder in the church and I sit there and have a conversation. And I start telling you, well, you know what? Glory to God. You know, and I'm sitting there just talking to an elder. Glory, you're talking about, well, we did this. We were invited to a church to speak and I'm sitting on the platform <clears throat> waiting to preach because I'm the preacher there. And they don't did the soul say, yeah, for an hour. And that was okay. If that's what you, how y'all do it, we'll soul say, yeah, for an hour. That's fine. Nothing wrong with that. And so then after we got through soul saying, yeah, they... They had, you know, how they do it. Let me have my testimonies. All right. So ain't nothing wrong with testimonies either. But what's something wrong with all these? Because one lady got up, started talking about the uh, Sister Loper who had died. And then a, a wet grief blanket fell on the place. Then another man got up because his wife had just died. Testified for another 25 minutes. Then the preacher, one of the preachers sitting across from me in the pool pit, got up on a cane and came up there talking about how the devil don't beat her down and, and how the devil's this and the devil. And I've got to preach. I'm sitting here like, boy, Jesus. Now, hold on. The only person that wasn't an elder in this whole story is the first person that spoke. Everybody else after that was either a minister a pastor or something, and they don't glorify the devil so much that we spent another hour and a half sitting there and they glorifying the devil to the point to where I was. When I got up, I'm like, my God, I couldn't get nothing done in that place. We could have just closed service down and said, all right, bring the hearse back it up to the door and let's roll everybody out of here and go to the, future, the cemetery. I mean, it was that bad. All right, pastor, come on and preach. Preach what? That's right. That's right. But I was a little young then myself, so I just got up there and just tried to preach over it. Couldn't get it done. And the Lord had to teach me some stuff about that. <clears throat> Don't you do that again? Don't you try to preach over that again? Mm -mm. I told the Lord that day, I tell you what, you let me sit in another one of them services. I'm hurting everybody's feelings. I'm going to interrupt everything and just bust out and take the mic and start talking. Because we can why? Hey, because you got other folks that's sitting out there that need stuff from God. And you just spent two hours telling these other laymen how powerful the devil is. I'm going to snatch the mic out of somebody's hand and they're going to just be mad. Don't invite me back. That'll be fine. But I'm here right now. And I'm going to preach Jesus. I'm going to talk to that pastor. See, if you start confessing, start confessing how Jesus has healed you, could talk about the devil and you over here talking about grit and just run the roll on them because it don't make any sense for us to glor keep glorifying the devil and we're supposed to be glorifying God. Amen. Talking about you an elder in the church. No, we know who the elders in the church are because the Bible says we can find out by your testimony, your voice, your conversation. Let me sit down with you long enough and I'll figure out who you are in the church. Amen. Don't tell me I'm the elder. I don't care. And I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I want to hear what you're getting ready to say. Because what we do is <clears throat> people slap these titles on themselves and then they think that that gives them a license to speak. And in the black church, I don't know about any other, but I can tell in the black church, we are duped and get fooled by that crap. Oh, that's prophet so-and-so. What that mean? Amen. Amen. You better be listening to what they're getting ready to say. Amen. Prophet so-and-so calls you up here and tells you, the Lord's going to move your husband out of your life. That's a lie. That's a lie. Amen. God don't move husbands Amen. or wives. God ain't doing that. You better be careful. God's going to teach you a lesson. Well, where that, where, what scripture did, did that come out of? No. Them people are just people that have gotten titles and they're still babies. Listen to their words. They're still babies. There are some people in the body of Christ who never will never stand the pool pit, but they some of the biggest spiritual giants you ever seen in your life when they speak stuff happen. Why? Because they know how to speak the word of God. 
You better know. Now, now let's come over here. Hebrews chapter 5. And I don't mean to be disrespectful. I believe in God and honoring uh, men and women of God who God has put in offices and who God has called. I believe you, you honor those people. But before you start passing down honor, you better start listening to who you're honoring first. You got to be for folks because, they, hey, it's the words you're sitting up under. My pastor, that's all right. I got, I mean, I'm strong enough. I can, I can, you know, eat the meat, spit out the bones. How many times we don't heard that? That ain't what the word says. The word didn't say that. The word says, how can they believe without a preacher? Which tells me if you sit there long enough, you'll start believing what they're saying because they're your preacher. I guarantee you. Sit there long enough, it'll start to sound true. All right. Verse 13. Well, let's read verse 12 with it. For when for time you ought to be teachers. Notice what Paul starts out here. He says, look, you've been around here long enough. You should be teaching something. But you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles in the oracles of God. And have become as such as need milk and not strong meat. In other words, Paul says, now by this time. So this is why I can tell you right there. Don't come tell me how long you've been in the child. I don't mean nothing. Especially, I just read for it, right? He says, by now, yeah, you've been here long enough now. You ought to be able to help somebody else. But Doug Gunner, we got to come teach you the ABCs of, of the kingdom of God all over again. For everyone that uses milk, everyone that's immature, is unskillful in the word of righteousness. For he is a baby. Notice. Unskilled in the word of God, you're a baby. See the connection? You don't know how to talk. That's what the Amplified Bible says. You're an infant, not able to talk yet. This is why when the pressure comes, you let anything fly out your mouth. Because that's what babies do. Isn't that what your kid do? When they get underneath pressure, they don't like something or something's bothering them, they just open their mouth up and just start saying with it. Why? Because they don't understand, they haven't matured to the point where they're able to handle pressure and know what to say and how to speak. But a grown person shouldn't be throwing a temper tantrum. We see many of them do, but they shouldn't. And then that's what happens in the church. Pastor Priest, I ain't going back over there because I always in my business. See, see, wrong word. See, you're a baby. You're a baby. Baby, I, uh, you know, you need to get this taken care of in your life. This is not right. You need to correct this. And you walk out offended. That pastor ain't got no love. <laughs> ain't no love in there. Well, yes, it is. That's why the pastor told you the truth. What you should have said is we went to the church down there and said, and, 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 and you high. As, and, 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 and you're living with somebody that's, and you don't left your husband and you're living with someone who's not your husband and you're still married and all that stuff and then the minister come pat you on the back and say oh, how you doing sister so and so it's so good to see you girl you know God's blessing you you see that's the one you should be saying ain't got no love cause my bible says whom he loves he does what corrects chastens but flesh reverses it don't chase me, because if you chase me, that means you don't love me. Well, see, see, that's, see, that's wicked, twisted thought. Twisted perception will lead to twisted word. The reason you can't, which will lead to a twisted life. Get it? And the reason that you can't get your life to go in the direction that you want it to go in is because you're living in a twisted reality. It ain't none of it based on what God said. My past, I read in the word. No, no, no. You base it on what you thought the word said. How much times you meditate and find out what it said. And then when people sent mature people into your life to tell you exactly what it said, you don't want to hear them. 
I'm just, we're just talking this morning. I'm not trying to beat anybody down. I'm just trying to give you the, what thus said the word of God. Back to where we talk, started at. Your words is controlling it, folks. It's your words. And how you see life is how it controls your words. Because that's what you plug it in. That's what you're feeding on. Now, we're, 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 we're getting there. We're almost there. Matthew chapter 12. Now, notice this. Matthew chapter 12, verse 33. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by its fruit. So you're either going to fill up with God's words and have God's fruit, or you're either going to keep filling up with Satan's words and have Satan's fruit. It's going to be either or. Notice there was no middle ground there. Either it's going to be one or the other is what, what, what Jesus is trying to get you to see. See, I don't know where we got off thinking that there's this middle gray area. There are no gray areas in the kingdom of God. It is black and white. It is either God or it's the devil. There is no in between. So you're either going to make the tree. The tree represents your life, the root of your life. Because tree is, is, is determined by the roots. So what's rooted in your life, either it's a good root or it's a bad root. But it's not both. And it says the fruit will be known by what? The tree will be known by what? The fruit. So if the root of that tree is an apple tree, what's in the root is going to produce what? Apples. If it's the root is at the root and, it's, uh, uh, and there's this, it's an orange tree, then if orange is in that root, then it's going to produce oranges on the branch. Right? Why do you think you're going to keep talking about how broke you are, how sick you are, how busted you are, how lonely you are, and think you're going to produce money, husband, wife on the branch? No. Whatever is at the root is what will hang on its branch. Whatever's at the root of your life, if it's not the word of God, if the source of it is not the word, it will not produce the good life, period. It'll produce a counterfeit. It'll produce a counterfeit all day long. But everybody knows anything, anybody know anything about counterfeit after a while, it'll do what? it wear out. Because it wasn't real. I don't care how much you're trying to fake, fake it till you make it. Well, after a while, you're supposed to make it. I agree, fake it till you make it, but come on, we can't be faking it for the rest of your life. At some point, it needs to become a reality. Then he goes on, he says here, whole generation of vipers. How can you be an evil? In other words, how can you, with an evil root, speak good things? Can't be done. For out of the abundance of the heart or, about, uh, or out of the root of a man's heart, his mouth would speak. A good man out of the good treasure or good deposit will produce or bring forth good things. And an evil man or a man full of twisted words out of the uh, deposit of those words will bring forth evil, wicked, twisted things. And then it goes on and says here that you will be known or justified by your words. Let's, let me read it from the Amplified Bible. For by your words, you will be justified and acquitted. And by your words, you will be condemned and sentenced. But for that, but, but, but I missed something here that, I'm, that I wanted to bring out. In verse 36, it says, but I say unto you that every idle word a man shall speak, he shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. Now, that day of judgment is not talking about when you get to heaven. No. That day of judgment is manifestation time. That's the judgment. So you've been talking about how broke you are when the repo man showed up? Judgment. That's the day of judgment. 
Oh, my back. <laughs> my back's killing me. And now you laid up for two and three weeks. Judgment. That's the day of judgment. I just can't seem to ever get ahead. And now you've been knocked back a few, few blocks. Day of judgment. Where'd it come from? What you said. See, you're justified by your words. Notice it says either your words will uh, condemn and sentence you. That's the day of judgment. Or your words will either uh, acquit you and, and free you. What are you saying? What are you saying? Do you listen to yourself well enough to hear what you are saying? Because that, that is the number one reason. It's not the only one, but it's the number one reason why you stay in the predicament that you're in. Number one reason. It is because of what you continue to say day after day after day after day after year after year. And you keep seeing the same thing. Nothing ever changes. And then what you end up doing is start making excuses for why the scenery hasn't changed. Oh, I'm believing God. He understands. Okay, well, yeah, we can hear that for the first couple of years, but now it's been 10, it's the same thing. Now, I mean, tell me God can't, 10 years don't pass and ain't nothing changed. You know, if I'm driving from here to Texas and I ain't got there in eight hours, I'm going to start to question something. Something's wrong here. Because we should be seeing some signs that say Texas. If I ain't seen a sign nowhere to say Texas, then obviously we need to pull over and re-examine this, this thing. Because, you know, I get it. When I first get on the freeway leaving Kansas City, I don't get nervous because I don't see no signs that say Texas. I ain't nowhere near Texas. I get that. But after that, I've been driving five, six hours, seven hours, I need to start saying something that's got something close to. The same thing is true with your life. I okay, can't, all right, you just got saved. Like, yeah. But you don't been around here for a minute now. The scenery should start changing. You are doing and looking the exact same way you were doing and looking 15 years ago when you got saved. Something wrong, because it don't take Jesus all day to do nothing. Nothing. And in particular, when it comes to bondages, when the Bible's already said, I'm free. Wait just one second, devil. Now, somebody don't lie. And it ain't God. What are you saying, folks? Whose words are you feeding on? Whose words are you consuming the most? Are you that Christian? that you fight based on how you perceive the battle's going? Or are you that Christian, you fight on what you believe and what you know from the word? Are you that Christian that listens to the lie of the devil and then looks at what he points to? Or are you the Christian that says, look here, I'm not moved by how I feel. I'm not moved by what I think. I'm moved by what the word of God said. It is written. Which Christian are you? Which, which one of them are you? Because I, I didn't say, now, now notice, I did not say you weren't a child of God. Because you saved. And you will, when you leave in this earth, you will go on to heaven. But I'm telling you right now, if you don't make the decision to start honoring the word of God in your life, although you will die and move to heaven, you will live like hell all every day of your life in this earth. And there is no other way for me to put that. It's a sad testimony, but it'll happen. It'll happen. While every day the Holy Spirit will be working with you, trying to get you to change. It's just the truth, folks. My pastor, that just don't sound right. It's, it's right. It's right. We can go through all through the scriptures. You will find this. Nothing happened in any of those men's life just because it happened. It didn't happen in Jesus' life just because it happened. Jesus, had, he told you how it happened. I do what I see my father do. How do you see it? In the word, Old Testament. I say 
what my father told me to say. And then what? The father that dwells within me, he does the work. That's what Jesus said. Now, if Jesus had to live that way, if that's how he had to get it done, what, 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 you, what you doing? When did we get a new plan? Who instituted a new, a new set of rules? They ain't come from heaven. God says, I changed not, so they didn't come from heaven. Well, you know what? That's obsolete. You know, you got folks in the body of Christ right now, people teaching that portions of this book is outdated and obsolete. And it doesn't mean that no more. You know, we've evolved. So what you're saying is God didn't evolve. You've, you've evolved over God. And you, you, you are wiser than him now, so we don't need his book anymore because we got our own rules now. What, this, what does that sound like? That sounds like in 2016, we got a bunch of folks that, have re, that has regressed all the way back to the book of Genesis, to Babel. Back to the Babylon, because that's what they said. But notice what it got them. In trouble and nothing. So what do you think it's going to do in 2016? When God's already said I change not. God doesn't have to improve upon his word. His word is already right. His word has already been proven that it's right. What we have to do is take his word, put it in our ears, put it in our eyes, put it before our eyes, put it in our mouths, and, and get it in our hearts. And then put it back in our ears, back before our eyes, back in our mouth, let it get in our heart. Back before our ears, back before our eyes, back in our hearts, and back in our mouths. And constantly, it's a cycle. What are we doing? We're building a capacity of faith on the inside of us to where the word of God will begin to become so greater than anything else in your life that it starts to push out everything that doesn't belong there. Because there's a scripture that says that every tree, every tree that God didn't plant must be uprooted so that the two trees can't dwell together. You're either going to have one or the other. But God's word will uproot Satan's. But I'm going to tell you this. Satan's tree will uproot God's in your life if you allow it. It's not more powerful, but if you make it more powerful, it will, it will choke, completely choke the roots out of the tree of God in your life and start growing a new one if you allow it. And you keep fertilizing it with your tongue. And it grows bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And before you know it, it's matured. And here's all the curse, fruit of the curse, falling in your yard of your life. And you have no idea, why is, what is this? Where did this come from? It came from your mouth. You get what you say. Now, that was simple. I mean, we didn't jump, shout, run, buck, and holler, but it's true. It's true. All right. Father, we thank you this morning for your words. Simple but true. Simple but true. And I believe I have come to the place of knowing and understanding that your word is right. And if we'll take this word and apply this word to our lives, it will do exactly what you said it would do. Bring life and bring it more abundantly. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.